Okay, let's get started. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about MDPs, Markov Decision Processes. Um, but before we do that, I have a quick update on Mini Contest 1. How many of you here participated in Mini Contest 1? Okay. What? Was there a question? Well, you're in good company. There are 200 participating teams of about 250 students. Uh, so thank you all for participating. There will be a sequence of these uh, culminating in a final contest, which I think is pretty awesome. And um, today I'm going to give you just a little bit of a view into what some of the top scoring teams did um, in Mini Contest 1. Before I do that, I always love to see what names people come up with. So you guys like just like type some random name, but like we're actually there looking there to see whether there's cool names. So we got a pretty good assortment of cool names. Uh, almost every year there is a waka waka waka, and as soon as I see that, I cannot then get that sound out of my head for the whole rest of the semester. So thanks waka 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 um, for getting that in my head. Um, more points, please. You'll have to report whether or not the name actually got you more points. Um, there's this bully ex expression which reminds me a lot of the requirements for the course, except with professor names put in. Um, and then, thank you whoever decided to stress test our string processing with this little emoji guy. <laughs> Some bugs were discovered. It's yeah, well, <laughs> well, thank you for stress testing our system in any case. Um, on to the meat of it. Which is, uh, in third place, we have team Winnie the Pooh. Is Winnie the Pooh here? Are Winnie the Pooh here? Okay. That is Philip and Winnie the Pooh, perhaps. Um, congratulations. In third place with score 1193. You'll notice these are all very tightly clustered in score. Uh, their bot used uh, BFS to find the nearest food and replanned whenever another agent ate the bot. So I'm going to play this here. Um, so probably... you. Those of you who are doing the contest are used to seeing these at a much higher rate, but watch all of these Pac-Men collaborate. Notice they're not sort of like, sometimes, sometimes there'll be like one sad Pac-Man in some solutions that follows another Pac-Man but never gets a dot, but these ones seem to coordinate pretty well. Good job. So. Good job, Winnie the Pooh. In second place, we have Team Jason L. Are you here, Jason L.? Congratulations. Um, score of 1,200. Bot description, lots of caching of pre-computed solutions uh, to reduce redundant computation, replanning, uh, as in the previous one, but also um, something that we saw a lot in, in many of the, the, uh, the agent submissions in the leaderboard, which was a sort of um, a prioritizing different directions, some kind of diversity so that the, the Pac-Man would spread out. So let's watch this go. There they go. Can you guys see this? Yes, you can. Okay. Those poor dots in the corner, they're always last. Okay, congratulations, Jason L. <laughs> and in first place, Team Yushang. Are you here, Yushang? All right. There's also Ryan. Are you here, Ryan? Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm going to call you guys Team Yusheng Ryan. You had a score of 1201, barely edging out the second place team by one point. What did you do? I have no idea. What did you do? You want to say really quickly? Cool. So again, this theme of reducing computation and also kind of giving the agents a way to specialize, which is always important in multi-agent systems. So let's see it. Let's see it. See if you can see the difference of the one point. All right, there they go. In future contests, it's going to be team versus team, and then it gets intense. All right, those last dots. 
All the Pac-Man headed that way. All right. Uh, congratulations, Yusheng and Ryan. Good job, everybody who participated. And uh, here's a here's a, uh, our final leaderboard. You can see those top three are really, really closely clustered. But really, there's just a whole bunch of teams that um, had really strong submissions. So congratulations to everybody there. Um, a couple others to eyeball, um, so you can get a sense of the ideas that kept coming up in some of the top submissions. Um, a lot of uh, pre-caching to make computation fit in uh, fit into the time, a lot of replanning, a lot of uh, prioritizing, keeping agents apart, some kind of diversity function, dividing food pellets up, kind of splitting goals, that kind of thing. So um, all these ideas, very successful. Um, so congratulations to everybody who participated, and I look forward to seeing uh, Mini Contest 2. So congratulations to everybody. Any questions on Mini Contest 1? All right. MDP is for real this time. All right, we're going to keep talking about MDPs. And today, we're going to talk about uh, methods that focus on the policies that we generate in MDPs so that we can start to solve them a little bit more efficiently and also understand a little bit what's going on inside algorithms like value iteration when we run them. So I can't say this enough. Grid world is both a really important running example because it's going to show up in your in your homeworks, it's going to show up in your projects, it's going to be all over lecture, it's probably going to show up in exams. At the same time, it is just one MDP. Okay. Most MDPs do not involve robots in a grid, they do not involve walls, and they do not involve the actions north, south, east, and west. But this one does. It's basically a maze. The agent's in a grid, and there are walls blocking the path, and then there are various exits. The actions are north, south, east, and west, and there's noise. So usually when you take an action, it does what you expect, and sometimes it does something different. We talked last time about the details. 10% um, of the time, you sort of go uh, uh, 90 degrees to the left of what you expected. 10% um, of the time, you go 90 degrees to the right of what you expected. And if there's a wall in your way, you stay put. This MDP has rewards that we talk about as a living reward, which is a possibly zero tiny little reward that you get step by step every time, even though the game hasn't ended, and then a large reward at the end when you take the exit action from a terminal square. And uh, here the, ex the, the, the big rewards are the plus one and the minus one, and the living reward is, is some value, maybe like minus 0 0.01. That terminology of a living reward, that's grid world terminology. In a generic MDP, there's just a reward function, and every step you get a reward. Maybe it's zero, maybe it's not. Um, it's just some reward R. The goal, in general, uh, for MDPs is to maximize the sum of rewards. And last time we talked about this idea that rewards further out in the future maybe should be discounted, um, either for algorithmic convenience or because it actually reflects that rewards further out in time are worth less to the agent. To recap, MDPs in general, not just grid world, even though grid world will often be our running example, um, MDPs are non-deterministic uh, search processes. So like search, there's a set of states S, and it's fully observed. So you know what state you're in. Later on in the course, you may not even know that. But right now, there's a set of states S, you know what state you're in. There's a set of actions, and you know what actions are available to you. What's different from search is there's now a transition function. Instead of actions having a successor, meaning you take this action and you end up in this state, there's now a distribution over successors given by the transition function. So whenever you see T of S A S prime, you think that's the probability that if I'm in state S and I take action A, the result will be S prime. Now, it's non-deterministic in the sense that from S A, I don't know what S prime I'm going to land on, but it is known in the sense that I know what probability each outcome has. And that's important, and that's going to become even more important towards the end of today, and especially next week. There's then a bunch of rewards, and for every SAS prime, you get a reward. So in a state S, taking action A, you'll get a reward. That reward in general is going to depend not just on S and A, but also on what happens. So if your action isn't successful, you may not get the same reward as if it is. And then there's a start state. We also talked about certain quantities that are going to show up over and over again in uh, formulating and solving MDPs, they're also going to show up over and over again when we talk about reinforcement learning. So it's good to get really clear on what they are today. So these are quantities that we can define mathematically, and then we can produce algorithms for computing them either incrementally or from each other, as we'll do today. So the important one um, 
The important one that we, that we talk about when we think about taking an action is the policy. A policy is a map of states to actions. So I give you a state, you tell me what to do. That's the policy. Search had a plan, and you could have a plan because you knew what was going to happen. Everything was deterministic. Now we have policies. Whatever state you end up in, it tells you what to do. It might be an explicit policy that lists the actions like we've seen in grid world. It might be an implicit policy that requires some computation like running Expectamax. In addition to policies, which map from states to actions, we had a notion of utility. The MDP has a notion of reward. So that function R there is a reward. Every time step, you get a reward. Might be big, might be small, might be zero. But every time step, you get a, what's called an instantaneous reward. A utility is the sum of all of those rewards or the sum of a discounted uh, series of those rewards. So it's a possibly discounted sum of rewards. That's the utility. The agent, all the agents we have are maximizing their expected utility, and um, utilities here are sum of discounted rewards. We talk about values. This is important, and I'll expand this in the next slide. Um, values are um, a function from states to numbers. So in that sense, they're a lot like a utility. What is a value of a state? It is the expected utility that you will get from that state. And you say, well, doesn't the utility sort of depend on a bunch of things? Doesn't it depend on what I do? Yes, but when we talk about the value, it's the value under acting optimally. You might not know what that is, but that's the mathematical definition of value. But then you say also, won't the rewards I get from a state depend not only on the policy I act according to, but also on what happens? Yes. And the value will be an average over everything that might happen uh, where that averages the various outcomes of the actions. And we'll see that. And in, in an expected max, that's what the chance nodes do. There's also Q values, which are, I think, the least intuitive of these quantities. Um, a Q value is the expected future utility, not from being in a state, but from being in a Q state, which is a chance node in an expected max tree. So whenever you think about an MDP, I think this is just the most useful diagram you can have in your head. In general, you're at some state S, and that's where you are right now. And when you're in a state S, you get to choose an action A. So anytime you're thinking about these actions, you're never going to pick one at random. You're going to pick the best one. You're always going to be maximizing over A, unless you're told a specific A to evaluate. Okay, so we max over A. When I'm in a state and an action, I get to a chance node. This represents having committed to the action. I'm in the state. It's too late to wish I was in another state. I've picked an action. It's too late to pick another action. But I'm not sure what S prime is going to happen yet, because I don't know which of the possible outcomes is going to obtain. So there's this um, range of S primes you could end up with, and in general, we will average over those. And so that basic kind of thought that you're in a state, you'll choose an action, and then some S prime will result according to the transition function, and giving you a reward for that time step, that's the basic cycle of an MDP. And then once you get to S prime, there's going to be some future. And in general, in these algorithms, the future will plug in some quantity as a placeholder for the future, because if we expanded the whole thing out, it would be this like big um, nested equation that would, would be uh, really difficult to handle. So um, we have these optimal quantities that we are going to be writing down expressions that either define them in terms of each other or define procedures which compute them. And these quantities may all start to blur together. If they haven't blurred together already, they may blur together today when we start talking about variations of them. It's important to keep them, uh, especially their definitions, it's important to keep them um, separate. So let's pull up the grid world and we'll look and see what values, Q values, and policies look like. And now here you can see there are stars. Whenever I talk about values, if I want to be extra clear that I'm talking about the value of the state, meaning the average utility, the expected utility of, from that state, if I, if I want to be clear that I mean under optimal choice of action, I'll put a star. So V star is the optimal values, Q star is the optimal Q values, and pi star, there are many policies pi. Some tell you to do wise things, and some tell you to do unwise things. Pi star uh, indicates an optimal policy. All right, let's bring up the demo. All right, so what does this demo do? This demo is uh, basically your uh, project, this is basically your project three. And what this has done is it has run value iteration, the algorithm from last time, which I'll recap quickly today. It's run value iteration for 100 iterations, which is basically enough to converge on, on this uh, MDP. So what's going on? This is a grid world instance with a plus one and a minus one uh, reward at the end in those two upper right squares. And then um, in addition, there is a discount factor. Um, there's a discount factor here. Let me move this so you can see all the details. 
Okay, so the discount here is 0.9. That means every step the reward is pushed into the future, it's going to be worth 0.9 times as much. And so if it's going to take you 10 steps to get that to get to that um, that 1.0, it's going to be worth less to you. And then um, there's also a a noise here, and in this case, I think there's not a living reward. So there's a noise of 0.2 as before. So what are these numbers? These numbers represent values. So here that's easy. If you're in this square here, the only possible future you have is the one where you get a 1 and then the game ends. What does this 8.5 uh, mean? Well, there's a lot of things that can happen. So let's say the policy is the one that's indicated here with the arrows, which is the optimal policy. If I act, most of the time I go into the exit and I get that discounted 1. Except 20% of the time, something different happens. Sometimes I'm still in the square, and then I go into the exit. Sometimes I slip to the hazard square that's, that uh, says 0.57 here, and so on. And so all of those possible futures each has a weight. Because I know what policies, I, what, I know what actions I'm, uh, I'm going to take. I can figure out that average. That's what that value is. It's the average utility you will get under optimal play, which in that case is the policy that's shown. Let me bring that back for a second. Um, those are the values of the states. And remember, states also had four actions for, for the states that aren't exits, and each of those actions corresponds to a Q state. So these are the Q values for those states. And if you remember from this, uh, this I don't know whether you can see my cursor well here, but this one that was 0.85 that's just to the left of the 1.0 square, you can now see that value 0.85 that came from optimal play from that is associated with the action of going east. There are other actions that belong to that state. So there are three other Q states from that state, and those also have lower values. So Q values, some are going to be high and some are going to be low. In the same way that some states are good and some are bad, and you should probably avoid the bad ones, some Q states are good and some states are bad, and you should probably avoid the bad ones. Okay. The difference is you have more direct control over what Q states you pick because you get to pick A directly. You don't get to pick S except by arranging a sequence of actions to get into that state. All right, move. Okay, last time we talked about the Bellman equations. Actually, there's a whole bunch of things that can be called Bellman equations. Bellman equations are basically any equations that write down um, these quantities from MDPs, values, Q values, policies, in terms of those uh, others of those quantities, usually in uh, one time step ahead. Uh, uh, look ahead. And they usually look like a little tiny fragment of an expectamax calculation. It basically boils down to this. If you want to do optimal things, because we've been talking about V star, V star, V star, that's the optimal value from a state. How the heck am I supposed to calculate how many points I'm going to get playing optimally if I don't even know what the policy is? The whole point of these algorithms is to find optimal policies uh, in most cases. So what the Bellman equations do is they break down that notion of optimality, which is this nebulous thing, into a one-step mutual recursion that lets you nail down a property that optimal values would have into a system of equations you can then solve. And they look like this. They basically say, whatever the optimal value is, it's going to look like doing the right thing where I plug in for the future other optimal values. Now, of course, I don't know them, but you know that'll be a problem for the algorithm, not for the math. So that definition of optimal utility um, that we have via sort of this expectamax computation uh, gives a one-step look-ahead relationship. We talked about this last time, so I'll go through this relatively quickly, but I think it's good to have it fresh for today because you're going to see variations of these equations. So what is the value of being in state S? What's that? You think, what I really want to know is what action should I take? Okay, we'll get to that, I promise. What is the value for state S? So V star, the optimal value in state S, is what I will get from state S on average if I play optimally? Well, we know what that is. That's a max over these chance nodes that are right underneath. Well, what's the value of those chance nodes? Well, they have values. Their values are Q values, uh, Q of S comma A. And so we get uh, this relationship between values and Q values, which is really simple. It says the optimum score from a state is going to be the score of the best Q state leaving that state. What does that mean? That means you maximize over all the actions and you pick the best Q underneath. Now, of course, that doesn't really help you uh, identify what V star is because you know what Q star is either. So you need to define Q star in, in terms of something. Well, you'll do that in terms of the next layer of the tree because the next layer of the tree is, again, max nodes. These are values, but they're values of different states. So we can get this 
relation of states up at the top to states at the bottom, and that relation of states at sort of some time step to states one layer d deeper in the tree, that's what the Bellman equations say. So what is Q star? Well, this one's probably worth writing, writing out um, quickly. So Q star, so the value, the expected max value of a chance node is going to be the average over all the possible outcomes of that action from that state. So we're going to have to average over all the outcomes. Each outcome has a weight. That weight is T S A S prime. That's the conditional probability of S prime given S and A. Now, for each S prime, I need to know um, what score I'm going to get if I land at that S prime. Well, right that instant, we're going to get a reward, S A R of S A S prime. And then I'm going to land in S prime. What's going to happen then? Well, of course, I will play optimally. What does that mean? I have no idea, but I have a symbol for it. And the symbol for it is V star of S prime. Okay, and there's a gamma in there to discount things in the future. So what this does, if you inline them, let me make my marginal handwriting go away and be replaced with beautiful LaTeX. So we can define V in terms of Q. That is the recursion where you write the value of a, of a max node in terms of its child chance nodes. You can write Q in terms of V. That's where you say that a chance node is the average of its children and expect a max. And if you inline that, you get the standard form of the Bellman equation. You'll notice the Qs are gone. That's the variable that you inline. So this here is the standard form. What does it say? It says, if I want to compute optimal values, which like a minute ago, I wasn't really even sure what they were. Now I have an expression for them. It says the optimal value has the property that it's the best of the actions that you can take from that state, where each action has a value that is an instantaneous report reward plus optimal future, discounted, blended together by your averaging function. So that's the Bellman equation for optimal values. It relates V stars to V stars. And you say, does that help me because I'm trying to find V stars, and if I need V stars to get V stars, how am I ahead? But this is just how systems of equations work. This characterizes the optimal values. It is not an algorithm for computing it. But we're a step ahead of where we were before. We have a, a system of equations we're trying to solve, and that's a precise thing, because now I have techniques for solving systems of equations. OK, any questions on that? That's the core bit. OK, so we have this algorithm. Value iteration, I'm not going to um, go through an example, but I want to show how it relates uh, to the equation I just showed. So Bellman equations characterize the optimal values. They say V star has this property that it's sort of equal to this expected max fragment with other V stars plugged in for the future. So we're defining V star in terms of V star, right? That is um, a system of equations. Can I solve this one? Well, it's not the easiest system of equations because of that max. Without that max, it would be a linear system. But with that max, it's kind of hard. Value iteration, which we talked about last time and ran an example of, computes these values. And it computes them uh, using an update that looks exactly like the Bellman equation and is called a Bellman update. So the equation has the same quantities on the left and right. The update does not. So in the update, what we do is we say, well, I don't know how to solve that system of equations directly, but if I imagine I had an approximation VK to the values of all the states, maybe it's a bad approximation. Maybe it's zero. In fact, V0 will be zero. If I had an approximation to the values of all the states, I could get a better approximation, or at least a new approximation to the values of all the states by running from each state a one-step, one-ply expect-a-max search, plugging in my old approximation as the... As the um, future cost. So here what I would do is I would say, well, um, I want to know the value of this. So I'm going to run expect a max. I'm going to max over the children for each, for each child. I'm going to average over the children. And then when I have to put in something that represents the whole future, I'm going to plug in my old estimate. right? And we also had these subscripts k. k represented not just the iteration of the algorithm, but how many rewards were taken into account in that computation. So V0 takes into account zero rewards. You produce V1, which is equivalent to a depth one tree being computed over, depth two, depth three, depth four. And as you run this iteration over and over again, you get successive approximations. And I told you, but did not prove to you that they will converge. OK, any questions on that? Yeah, so the question is, are you going sort of down the tree, kind of like uh, you expect a max? 
This is sort of like a lot of dynamic programs. Everything's been flipped around. We compute v0, which represents all of the possible depth zero trees, right? v0 of this state, v0 of this state, and so on. You compute all the v0s. And so now I know what any depth zero expect a max will be, which is zero. Then I compute all the v1s, which is all the depth one trees. And then I compute all the v2s. Now, v2 trees would start to get expensive, except I'm just going to plug in my v1 answers after one layer. So each layer of this is like one ply of expectamax from every state, and it'll just be grabbing things from my cache from the previous approximation. So as I go, I'm getting the values from deeper and deeper trees. But it sort of feels like you start at the bottom and work your way up. OK, good question. All right, so. Value iteration, last time we talked about these time-limited values. I'm not going to get into that again. But from here, what I can actually just look at this and say, that was a system of equations, and I am solving it using a fixed-point solution method. I take my values from my variables, I push them from one side of the equation to the other, and then I do it again and again and again. And if I find a fixed point, I'm solved. Now, of course, with fixed points methods, we don't know it's going to converge, but this is a fixed-point method, and I'm claiming to you it will converge. How do we know it will converge? Uh, I just so happen to have a slide on it. OK, so I'm going to sketch a proof. All right, so if you're totally clear on value iteration, great. If you're still trying to kind of figure out what is this update, all you really need to know is that vk, a vector of values for each state, is a sequence of approximations to the values, which may or may not converge. OK, and the first one's going to be 0. Moreover, vk represents the result of running expectamax over a depth k tree, or equivalently, the expected utility for k steps starting in a given state. OK, that's what you need to sort of uh, make sure you, that's what you need to have in order to um, follow the sketch here. So how do we know that this, these vectors of vk are going to converge, provided they are indeed computing these depth k computations? Case one, the actual tree of the MDP has a maximum depth. Well, then once, once I get to that depth, I actually have untruncated exact values and I'm done. But that's a little weird. That's only, that only works for MDPs that actually, when you unroll them from every single state, they unroll into a tree that terminates within M steps every single time. That usually only happens if you actually have a timer in your MDP and you have some time-limited uh, state space. Case two, this is the general case. And in this case, in order to show that it's going to converge, um, we assume that the discount gamma is less than 1. And the argument goes something like this. Well, what does vk compute? Well, vk computes, for any given state, vk computes the result of running expectamax to depth k. So k time steps in the future. vk plus 1 from each state looks at k plus 1 steps into the future. Those are trees one layer deeper. But they're otherwise identical. OK, and so we think, well, how different can it be if you take a tree of depth k and another tree of depth k plus 1 that's equivalent for the top k layers? How different can they possibly be? Well, we can think of this one on the left as actually being depth k plus 1, because we can pad out the bottom with what value? Zero. Zero. OK. So the trees are the same, except the bottom layers are different. On the left, there's the value 0 on the bottom layer. On the right, what's the value? Who knows? It was whatever the rewards in the MDP are, but at worst, it's sort of R min, some lower bound on the rewards. And at most, it's R max. So there's a range, there's a bound. Okay? So at worst, it's, it's, um, it's one. At best, it's the other. Now, up here, things are undiscounted. Down here, things are discounted pretty heavily. Down here, things are discounted by gamma to the K. So, all those rewards down there, they're, they're pretty small when you add them together with the stuff up above. OK? And so when I look and I say, what pops out of this calculation? Well, it's gonna, there's this max and the average and a max. But all of those things that I'm maxing and averaging and maxing, in one case, have a 0 at the end. And in the other case, have one of these other terms at the end. So the difference between them is at most bounded by the difference between r min and r max uh, here, discounted gamma to the k. So these two values at the root can't be that different because they're the same until the bottom, and that bottom is heavily discounted. So as k increases, that difference between the values gets pushed further and further, which means it has more and more layers of, of gamma 
and therefore the difference between successive um, rounds of this algorithm's approximations are going to shrink in this way. Okay, that's a sketch. That's not all the details, but that's the basic idea. It's a contraction argument. Okay. All right. That was louder than I expected. Sorry. Uh, policy methods. Let's talk about uh, uh, policy methods here. So what have we talked about so far? We talked about important quantities and MDPs. We talked a lot about what the value of a state is and how I can compute it in terms of values of other states, which then gave us the value iteration algorithm. Except this is weird in a couple ways. One, I don't think any of you woke up this morning thinking, I really want to know how to find the value of a state. In the same way that you, when, you run, when you run minimax, you don't really care the minimax value of the root. You're running minimax to get the action at the root. So we got to like anchor this back to policies because we're trying to figure out how to act. Um, the other thing is value iteration, as we saw last time, can be pretty slow. And so we're going to talk about better methods to do that. So we're going to talk about methods that look at policies, evaluating policies, improving policies, and extracting policies. And then we'll be in a position to move on to reinforcement learning. There's a question. What's the proof of gamma's one? If gamma's one, they may not converge because you can easily have MDPs where the values diverge. Even the values themselves may not be finite. So all kinds of things. Now, there are other cases that you can imagine, like if you can guarantee an absorbing state or something, it becomes analogous to the fixed depth. Um, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a very important point. When gamma's one, you don't really have these convergence guarantees. All right, policy methods. First one is policy evaluation. So up till now, we've been talking about Calculating quantities that are optimal quantities. What is the value of this state if I act optimally? Okay. Policy evaluation is simpler. In policy evaluation, someone has given you a policy. It may be good. It may be bad. It may be optimal. It may be terrible. All you want to know is how good is this policy. Tell me for each state what my score will be if I do the thing written on this map. Okay. And the answer might be, all right, it's bad or it's really good. How are computations different if you have a fixed policy? Well, it turns out they're much, much easier. And the short reason why they're easier is all those maxes go away. You don't have to think about what's the best action. Someone has told you the action. All you have to think about is the different possible outcomes. And that just forms some big linear system um, that's a lot easier to work with. So an expect a max, or a general MDP when you're computing an optimal quantity, which is what expect a max does, you form a computation tree that considers all the possible actions so that you can max over them and thereby choose the best one. Okay? So what do you do? Well, you take your state, you max over all the actions, and then for each of those possible actions, you compute the value of that action, which is a Q value. Okay? That's what happens when you're trying to do optimal things. This is the computation of V star of S. That's what it looks like. And then, of course, it continues down. What if um, you had some fixed policy? Well, now you don't have to act optimally anymore. You just have to act the way pi tells you. You just have to follow pi. So if pi were telling you what to do, we wouldn't be trying to compute v star of s, the score or utility under optimal action, which is hard because we don't know what optimal action. Now we're in this much easier world where all we have to do is figure out what our average score will be if we do pi. We know what pi is. It's given to us as input. So we only have to evaluate this one policy. And that means that when you're at the equivalent of a max node here and you're computing the value of a state, it's a value according to pi. There's only one edge going out of it. There's only one action. Pi is telling you to do pi of s, so you do it. Now, of course, there's still the same sum you have to think about over all the possible outcomes. The policy won't tell you what will happen. It'll just tell you what to do. So it's the, it's the max nodes that get simpler. All right? So let's think about utilities for a fixed policy. In some ways, these, are, I think, are easier to think about than the optimal ones. So another basic operation with MDPs is to compute the utility of a state not under optimal play, but under a, a fixed, presumably non-optimal in general, policy. So let's define the utility of a state under a fixed policy of pi. V pi of s is going to be the expected total discounted reward starting in that state and following pi. That's, again, given by this tree, except now there's no max nodes anymore. There's just pi nodes, and then, uh, and then chance nodes. So we can compute that out with the same kind of recursive relation. So I can say, well, I don't know what v pi of a state s is, but I can look at my fragment and I can say, well, luckily I don't have to max over a anymore. But I still need to average over what's going to happen when I do pi of s. So I whip out my trusty average. I average over the possible s primes that could happen if I did pi of s from state s. And I take an average. Well, the probability that s prime will happen 
if I take pi of s as my action, is that transition function. And then what score will I get? Well, I'll get a reward right then. It'll be the reward corresponding to being in state s, taking pi of s, and then landing in this s prime, and I'm going to consider them all, plus, remember the utility is the current reward plus discounted future rewards. So I discount my future, and then I plug in my future rewards. My future rewards are from state s prime. And the future value is not the optimal value from s prime, but presuming I continue to do what pi says, v pi of s prime. So this looks a lot like the equation before, except you'll notice the max over a has been replaced by a equals pi of s. So it's a little easier. Okay. There it is. And um, this is actually, if you look at this now, this is now a linear system of equations. So on the back of your head, you should think, even if I totally space this algorithm I'm about to learn, I can always just solve linear equations by sticking them in MATLAB or something. All right. So um, let's do, think of an example. Um, here is uh, one of our robots in a grid world. And this robot has been handed the always go right policy. This is a policy. Is it a good policy? It's a pretty bad policy. How, how likely are you to actually make it across the bridge? Pretty unlikely. You have to, like, the robot's going to continually try to throw itself off the bridge, and, like, maybe it fails over and over again and gets to the other side. This is a bad policy. Okay. Here's another policy. This one's presumably the optimal one of always go forward. Okay. So here are two policies under the same MDP. Each state is going to have a value for the, the, the first policy, and each state is going to have a value for the second policy. In general, the values are going to be higher for the second policy because you accumulate more rewards. But every, every policy has a value function. The values are just sometimes bad. Okay. From these policies that I sh or from these scenarios that I showed you here with the different policies, here are the actual values of those policies. So of course the exact numbers depend on what we associate with falling off the cliff here. It's minus 10, getting to the edge is 100, and then what's the discount, what's the living reward. So don't worry about the specific numbers, but for some reasonable setting of this MDP, you can see that always go right has a really, really bad, okay, so V of always go right is really bad unless you happen to be in the exit square because you have no choice but to get your reward. It's like kind of not too bad from this state because there's a decent enough chance that you'll fail to throw yourself off the cliff that you get a couple points. Okay? Always go forward. What's that V? It also has an identically shaped value function. Each square has a value, except now the values are much better because for most states, your expected discounted rewards will be higher. It's a better policy. So one way to find a good policy is to enumerate all the policies, evaluate them all, and pick the one where the numbers are the highest. It's not a good algorithm. But the point here is you can think of the policy as a thing you search over, and we're going to start doing that right now. Any questions? All right. Policy evaluation. One trick we do over and over again with these Bellman systems of equations, or should I say systems of Bellman equations, is we take these equality equations that we don't know how to solve. We turn the equalities into updates, and then provided certain conditions hold, we know that those updates will converge to the right, uh, the right fixed points. So how do we calculate Vs? Well, one idea is we can turn these recursive uh, equations into updates. It's just like value iteration, except it's easier. We start off by saying, if you have zero time steps left, my first approximation is every state gets zero rewards. That's easy. But then I say, what will I get on average after k plus 1 steps of following pi from state s? And I'll do this for every state. I say, well, um, I can figure out what happens next. The next thing is going to be I'm going to take action pi of s. And then, well, chance node kicks in. So s prime will be my next, next state. I don't know which one, so I have to average over all the states that can happen from state s and action pi of s. So I average over all the s primes. For each one of these, I will get a reward of s pi of s, s prime, and then a discounted future. Well, what's the future look like? Well, I have k plus 1 steps. I just took a step. That means my future only has k steps. It's of state s prime, and it's a future from following pi, not a future of star, which is optimal action for k steps. So here you go. Magic LaTeX appear. OK. Um, so here now you have an update. If this arrow were an equation, 
and the k plus 1 and k were gone, this would be the Bellman equation. I take the equation, I turn it into an update. It's now a fixed point solution method um, that represents a dynamic program for solving this. You would look at this and you say, that looks like value iteration, except instead of maxing, I just take the action I'm stuck with. That's right. It's got a name. It's called policy evaluation. But it is just value iteration where you don't do a max. OK, so you run this, and you run this, and you run this, and you'll eventually get a vector where for each state, you have a value that tells you your average score from that. Um, this only makes sense when the number of states is, is manageable. And the reason for that is your efficiency here is s squared per iteration. So I have to do this thing s times per iteration. I have to visit each state and compute its new approximation. And then for each state, I need to loop over all of the possible outcomes of the action I've been told to take. Right? So that's another factor of s. And you think, wait, but each state probably doesn't lead to every possible other state. That's right. Most MDPs are not fully connected. And so sometimes the branching factor here is much less than x than, than s. This is better than value iteration, because value iteration also had a max in here. And that max um, gave rise to another factor of a, which is much more expensive. OK. And again, as we talked about before, if you didn't, it's now that the maxes are gone, uh, there's nothing nasty here. It's a system of linear equations, and we know how to solve those. OK. So now we have, what was that? What just happened? Policy evaluation. Input, a policy, mapping from states to actions. Output, a vector of values. Not optimal values, pi values. If pi happened to be optimal, they'd be optimal values. But in general, you've just evaluated some completely arbitrary policy pi. Now it's time for the opposite. Policy evaluation takes a policy and produces values. Now we're going to take values and produce a policy. So this is like you sit down, you're going to play the grandmaster at chess, and you have a secret. You have, through some magical means, have access to the value of every configuration of the chessboard. Great. Does this help you? How do you turn values into knowing what action to take? Because you sit down and you're like, checkmate, right? That's not really how the game works, right? You need to actually look at the board and pick a move. So how are we going to turn how, scores of states into moves. And so you think, well, that's maybe not too hard. I'll do a look ahead. I'll see what I can do, and then look at the values. That's basically the idea. But let's, let's dig in a little more. And we'll see something that's actually very deep that will show up uh, next week as well with reinforcement learning. How are we going to compute actions from values? OK, let's imagine somebody gives you optimal values, which is a big deal, right? These optimal values may be intractable to compute. You have optimal values. How are you going to extract a policy for them? Or equivalently, what policy do these values imply? Well, here's a little grid world. And in this grid world, there are um, values on every state. And um, let, these are the optimal values that have been computed through value iteration. So let's think, how should we act? Well, let's imagine you were in this interesting state here, the 0.89. Okay? And Shown on this slide is the actual optimal policy. So in this case, what are you supposed to do from here? You're supposed to go west and do the shimmy thing. So this is a setting of the grid world where the right thing is to do the shimmy thing. But if you just looked at the values and you didn't see that arrow, what would you do? You'd look at it, you'd be like 0.89. Like, guess that's OK. What should I do? Well, I'd, I'd like that 0.98, please. Except you don't have an action that gets you to that square. You've got north, south, east, and west, and they do a variety of things with noise. Right? And so even though you might wish you were in a state, you don't get to do that. You just need to decide what action is best. So you think, well, how, how good is north? Like, is it going to get me to the 0.98, or is it going to drop me in the pit, or what? And so in order to figure out how to act, you need to unroll all of your actions far enough in the expectamax tree that you can plug in these magical optimal values that you've been given. So acting's actually sort of a pain in the butt. Um, and it looks like this. We need to say, all right, I need to know the optimal action for s. I have the optimal values, but unfortunately, I don't have the optimal actions yet. So let's start doing an expectamax until I find a place to put these optimal values that I've been so luckily given. So what I'll do is I'm going to have to do some computation for every a, because I'm going to have to look at all my actions and see which one of these actions actually achieves this value that I know to be the value of this state. Right? And so what I'll do is I'll look at all the actions A, and for each one I'll say, well, OK, for that action, some S prime is going to happen. For that S prime, I'm going to get a reward. The reward's going to correspond to the reward from state S, action A, landing in S prime, plus a future value, which luckily I know, for every S prime. Can't forget my discount. 
I can't forget the fact that s prime was not deterministic, so I have to average over all the possible s primes. So I have to do this computation here. What is this computation here? That's a chance node. That's a Q value, right? I have to compute that again, but I'll plug in V star. Okay. Now, what do I do with A? I'm going to compute each of these Q values, and I'm going to say, all right, north was the best. I'm going to do north. That's almost a max over A, but a max over A would be a number. It'd be like 7.6. I don't want to know that 7.6 is the answer. I want to know that north is the action which has the maximum value. The way we write that, which many of you have probably um, seen in some other context, is argmax. Um, so I say, I want the argmax over A, the A which gives you the maximum value of this unrolled chance node computation. So that's sort of a pain. Even though I have the optimal values, I still need to do a layer of expect a max to figure out what actions give rise to them. Choosing actions from values is annoying. Okay? All right, there it is, pretty. This thing where I give you values and you extract a policy from them, it is called policy extraction, and it gets the policy that's implied by those values. If those values are the optimal values, it will extract for you the optimal policy. If those values are some other values, it'll extract some other policy. Okay? But it'll extract a policy that's sort of driven by those values um, as a one-step look ahead. All right. On the other hand, these Q states, which are weird, and that's why we don't have a name for them in common uh, terminology, um, they're actually really nice for this purpose. Because if instead of giving you the values, somebody gave you the optimal Q values, it would be really, really, really easy to select actions. Because if you were in this state here, where we were trying to figure out how do we get that 0.89, well, it's really easy. That 0.89 lives on the Q state corresponding to that square and west. That square in north has a different value. It's 0.76. So if you have the Q values, you can just look around at all the actions, and you know their Q values have been computed for you already. So how should UA act? It's trivial. You take an argmax of the Q values uh, surrounding you. The moral of the story is that actions are way easier to select from Q values than values. This observation is basically what unlocked modern reinforcement learning, um, and we'll talk about that next week. Okay? Okay. So... Let's see. We'll take a two-minute break now. Then we'll talk about the, an algorithm that combines these two ideas into something called policy iteration, and we'll get our first taste of reinforcement learning. OK, so two minutes. Now, there's a qu request to go back to the previous slide. I will do that. By the way, these slides are always up before lecture if um, you want them. Actually, if you really click around, the lecture is up before lecture, because we have past lectures recorded.
Okay. All right. Policy iteration. Once you have policy evaluation, which takes a f policy and produces values, and you have policy extraction, which takes values and figures out what policy they imply, policy iteration is actually a really simple algorithm. You just alternate those two. So why do we even do it? Well, there's some problems with value iteration. Um, and let's take a look. Let's take a look at value iteration happening here. All right, so this is going to be um, our favorite grid world. And every time I hit the button, I'm going to get a, a, a round of value iteration. And on this grid world, it's like it's super fast. Okay, so what you'll remember is you can think it in the back of your head. Two things are happening. One is we are doing an iterative algorithm that will eventually converge to the true optimal values. Great. It's also the case that if I run this for k iterations, say seven iterations, I will have sort of the values that represent the MDP if it were truncated after seven more rewards. So after zero rewards, my approximation is zero. And then I update. Some of them turned non-zero. And I update, and I update, and I update, and I update, and I update. And then for a while, things are changing. But you'll notice now that I'm up to iteration 19, and maybe some numbers will change, but the errors are pretty much done. So if I do this for a long time, with enough uh, degrees of precision, some numbers are still changing, some infinite series are still slowly accumulating, um, but there's just not that many um, futures from any given state that are that long. So they add up to value, but they don't actually add up to a lot of um, change in the policy. This is a very common thing. So a common thing is with value iteration is basically got um, a major problem, which is S squared A is really slow. That means you have to visit every state, and sometimes that's just a deal breaker. We'll talk about approximate methods um, starting next week. But even if you did that, you would then visit each state and each successor to that state, which we write as S squared, but usually it's not as bad as S squared. And then for each one, you have to look at every possible action. So it's slow. However, the max at each state almost always doesn't change. So if you saw, you saw I went like 100 iterations into value iteration, and the numbers were changing. So those chance nodes that compute those sums were giving different results. But the max, the one that decides which child is the one that actually supports optimal uh, behavior, they weren't changing. The policy was fixed. So for every action other than the one that we had already landed on, that computation was wasted. Also something you saw, which is very related, is that the policy has often converged long before the values. And once the policy converges, every branch of that expected max tree that doesn't correspond to an optimal action is wasted computation. So you're doing a factor of A of wasted computation. OK, so how can we fix that? Um, these are in there so you can see it yourself. OK, let's do policy iteration is an alternative to this. So an alternative approach for optimal values looks like this. Step one, you're going to do a policy evaluation. You will compute the utilities, the values, not for the optimal policy, but just for some policy. On the plus side, this is going to be pretty fast, because policy evaluation is a factor of A faster than, policy than uh, value iteration. The downside will be you have values for the wrong policy. Life's full of trade-offs. Step two is you will improve your policy. Now that you have values, not of the optimal policy, but of random policy, um, you will do a one-step look-ahead improvement round where you actually consider all the actions again, and you extract a one-step look-ahead policy against those values. OK, that is just as slow as value iteration, it's, uh, uh, as, as an iteration of value iteration. It is an iteration of value iteration. You can repeat those until the policy converges. That's it. So it's policy iteration. It's still optimal, because step two alone repeated would be optimal. It would be value iteration. Um, but it can be much faster. You evaluate the policy you've got for a while. And then every now and then, you go back in, and you consider the other actions. And then you start evaluating this policy for a while. OK, so let's write that out in math. Um, but it really is just a synthesis of these others. So um, these are going to look exactly like the equations from before. Um, that is a, a feature, not a bug. So evaluation. We fix a policy pi, presumably a bad policy. And we find its values. And we iterate the following until it converges. OK, what is this equation? This is the equation that says the values are an average of the results according to pi, um, where I plug in future pi values as my um, truncation function. 
Great. I run this for a while. I don't have to max over actions. I'm just going to follow pi. And now I know the values of all the states for pi. Now I do improvement. I do one step look ahead. This is the one that does all the work. I say, I want my new policy. I want policy i plus 1, pi of i plus, pi i plus 1 of x. Well, now I take an argmax. From s, I consider all the actions once again, just like in value iteration, or expect a max. And for each action, well, I do that same thing where I average all the possible outcomes and plug in a truncation function. The truncation function here came from the previous round um, of the policy I just evaluated. Now you think, am I going to get the same policy pi out? You're not, not in general, because although you're plugging in values from v pi, you're plugging them in inside an admittedly small expectamax tree. And remember when we played, when we talked about minimax, we had these evaluation functions for a chess position. We bury it deep into a minimax tree or an expectamax tree. And even though that evaluation function isn't very good, if you bury it under enough layers of look ahead, it starts mattering less and less whether that approximation is correct. And so this approximation v pi is being buried under a layer of look ahead and a gamma, so it's being discounted. And so this process will improve your, um, improve your policy, and then you go back and forth. That's policy iteration. Any questions? Let me make the red go away. Any questions about this? OK. A very, very common uh, state to be in right now is some mix of symbol shock, like so many v's, so many pi's, so many q's, and all possible configurations, and the feeling that you have just seen the same equation like 17 times with minor variations. You have just seen the same equation 17 times with minor variations. It all comes down to just one layer of expect a max, either relating a max node to a chance node, a chance node to a max node, that's v's to q's or q's to v's, or maybe v's to v's. You can write out an Bellman equation from q to q if you want. It's all the same thing with just uh, kind of different starting points and ending points in that expect a max tree. The other difference is whether you max over your actions or you just take action pi. And that's the difference between computing pi values, the evaluation of policy pi, or optimal values. And so really, it is the same core of a one-step look ahead expect a max, starting in different places, ending in different places, with different assumptions about optimality. So let's compare. All right, we have value iteration, we have policy iteration. They compute the exact same thing. They take an MDP. They then compute for each state the optimal value. That's what value iteration and policy iteration do. In value iteration, each iteration you consider both all the values um, and also the policy, because that place where you maxed over the, the, the A's, if you remember which one was the biggest, that's the policy. You don't track that policy, but when you take that max, you're recomputing it every time. In policy iteration, in contrast, you usually keep your policy fixed and do a bunch of tracking of value changes under that policy, and every now and then let the policy uh, consider other, other actions. If the policy is changing all the time, you're wasting your time. If the policy is changing rarely, you save a lot of time. And that's the trade-off here. Usually this is faster. OK. Here's the summary, and then we're going to branch into a little reinforcement learning. Actually, before I summarize, any questions? So, so this is for the policy update. How much? How many rounds of that do we have to do? This is actually this is, this is it's a great question. When you improve your values for a fixed policy, you might do this a lot. You might do this. You know, it's until convergence. You might do this 100x. When you do a one-step look ahead, you do this once. You do a one-step look ahead, and then you go back and you do 100 times with this new policy. So there's a, there's a cycle here, which is you pick, take your policy, evaluate it. That means you run these faster updates until convergence. Yep, and then once you get a new policy, you go up and you evaluate it. And so you're spending most of your iterations evaluating policies. And every hundredth iteration, you actually update the policy. Um, so the question is, does this take a lot of time? It can. It can. But in general, this is a factor of A, faster. 
And you don't actually, so one thing, one difference in, in reality, this is, is actually a great point. Um, one difference is that you don't, when you do this in practice, you don't start the evaluation over at zero. You start it at your old values. So if the policy hasn't changed much, you're pretty close to begin with. There are ways to speed this up. In general, it is faster. You can think of it just as value iteration, where sometimes you, instead of looping over the actions, you just recycle the last round's, fast, the last round's preferred action. And then it's easier to see why it would be faster. It's a good question. Any others? Or, practice, uh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. In general, whether it's value iteration or policy iteration, when you iterate these things, when do you stop? You have to have some notion of conver convergence, and that's generally based on the size of the changes, and there's different criteria. You can also do fixed iterations. Um, but when you've got this view of an embedded uh, um, optimization, the question is, how, like, how much polishing do you want to do of vPi if you're just going to change pi? And so you don't want to, in general, with these methods, you don't want to over-optimize intermediate quantities that are just going to be discarded and turned into other quantities. And so, you, so in general, it is not the case that you start the evaluation step at zero, and it's also not the, step, the case that you have a strict convergence. You might just run it five times for every one improvement step. Th these, are all, these are all questions for which the answer is there are trade-offs, and uh, there's no hard and fast answer. Basically, as long as you do sort of visit every, you don't even have to visit every state every time. As long as you visit every state and every action from that state infinitely often, you'll eventually converge to the right thing. These methods are very robust to being sort of juggled around the orders in which you, you do uh, limited or complete um, simplified or, or full Bellman updates. OK. Um, all right. Summary. And then we're going to talk about reinforcement learning a little bit. Um, what if you have an MDP and you would like to compute optimal values? Use value iteration or policy iteration. Okay. If you want to compute values for a particular policy, you use policy evaluation. It's faster. Um, if you have a policy that you wish to turn, if you have values and you wish to turn them into a policy, use policy extraction, which is just a one-step look ahead where you plug those values in. If those values are really good, that one-step look-ahead policy might be really good. If those values are zero, you just did a level one expect max. Don't expect much out of your policy. But maybe it's already better than moving randomly. OK, you look at these and you say these are all the same. These are, like I said before, these are basically all variations of the Bellman updates. Um, and they're all just one-step look-ahead fragments. Um, that point where you realize they're actually all the same and, 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 and there's, there's sort of a core piece that you then pin down in various ways, um, that is both a point of high confusion conceptually and also a point where once you get through that, everything um, starts to be a little easier to remember because the arbitrariness starts to be determined by, by the, the purpose. Okay? All right, reinforcement learning. Let's play slots. Okay, this is CS188 slots. Um, imagine you are a robot. We will pick actions for this robot. And there are two slot machines, blue and red. The blue slot machine, every time you pull the lever, gives you a dollar. It's a pretty good slot machine. Real slot machines aren't like this. I would love this slot machine. OK. The other slot machine, when you pull the lever, it either gives you zero or two. OK? Now, what should we do? Well, of course we're going to formulate it as an MDP. OK. Except it's a really, really simple MDP. It's even simpler than what's on the slide. So uh, uh, if anything, the thing on the slide overcomplicates it. You have an MDP in which your actions are you can pull the blue lever and get your dollar, or you can pull the re red lever and have a little bit of excitement and get either zero or two. In this particular formulation, I've split up two states. There's really only one state. There's really just, I'm in the state. What do I do next? But if you actually look at the MDP formalism, the reward I get depends on whether I win or lose. And so S prime needs to be different if I win or lose. So here's, if anything, an over uh, uh, complication of this MDP. And if you look at it, you see that the, from, from either state, the blue action takes you, you're a winner, you are an instant winner for a dollar. And the red action from either state, 75% chance of giving you two dollars, 25% chance of giving you zero dollars. All right, let's avoid infinite rewards. Um, so there will be no discount because they'll just make this messy. There's 100 time steps, so the answers aren't all infinity. Um, and we know the MDP. We know both states are going to have the same value, so we can sort of collapse that notion. Let's look at this MDP and think really hard and decide what is the optimum policy. OK. Well, what's going to happen if I choose the policy play blue? That's a policy. Let's evaluate it. What is the value 
the states are the same. So what is the value of the policy play blue? Presuming that's going to be 100 time steps. How much money will I make if I always play blue 100 times? $100. OK, how about play red? That's a policy. Let's evaluate that policy. What am I going to get? Well, you look at it and you're like, I don't know what you're going to get because there's a slot machine, right? And remember, the value of um, the value is the is the expected discounted reward. So it's the expected reward. So I'm going to go a hundred steps, and on an expectation, an average, what am I going to get? I don't know what I'll actually get, but on average, what am I going to get? 150. Okay. Here we are. You just did offline planning. We did not play slots. You looked at the MDP, you thought and you thought and you thought deep and profound thoughts, and you came to the realization that play red has value 150, play blue has value 100. What is the optimal policy for this MDP? Play red. All right, great. Okay, you knew the quantities of the MDP, you determined values and policies, all of that, just thinking offline, using math, and the input values from the MDP. Great, let's play. Okay, I hope you solved the MDP correctly because it's real fake money now, okay? So we're going to actually play. What should, what, what should I play? I want to be optimal. Red. Okay, cool, $2. Okay, but I thought I was just going to get $1.50. Okay, that's an expectation. The actual thing that happens is going to be a sample, okay? $2. Now what? What should I play? Red. $2. Now what? Red. Now? Red. 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 I can't stop. Okay. We just played 10 times. How'd we do? We got $12. On average, what will we get? On average, we would have gotten 15. So even like a little unlucky, but not catastrophically unlucky. What we did offline when we thought about the averages and compared them and did math, that was solving an MDP. This is actually playing the real fake game. Okay, we actually got samples back. They may or may not adhere to the average. The average is just an average. Okay, and that was actually playing the game. Important distinction, even though, yes, they were both just on PowerPoint. Okay? Are you ready? Rules are going to change. You walk into the new and improved CS188 casino, and the rules have changed. There is still the $1 slot machine. There is now the 0 or $2 slot machine, just like before, except you don't know its payoff probability. You don't know how likely you are to win. So it's the same MDP in structure, but I no longer know the probability that I'll get the two. Maybe I'll always get the two. Maybe I'll never get the two. I don't know. OK, so I just took something away from you. You don't know the MDP anymore. You know that there is an MDP that is a useful formalism and a useful way to think about the world, but you don't know what the MDP is. You don't know its parameters. OK, everything is different. You are now uh, in a totally different world. Time to play, right? You cannot think deep thoughts now and figure out the value of the red policy. Right? You don't have the necessary information. How are you going to get the necessary information to figure out how to act optimally? We have to actually act. So let's play. Which lever should I pull? Red? Who wants red? Who wants blue? All right, we'll go with red. OK, red, I got a zero. Must be a dud, right? It's just a sample. OK. Who wants red? Who wants blue? Who wants red? Who wants blue? OK. Zero. Who wants red? Who wants blue? It's, it, it's, nobody else want, nobody's wanting blue, but there are fewer, fewer red hands. OK, red. Red. OK, we played four times. Who wants red? All right, yeah, they're starting to come back. Red's seeming a little bit better, because we finally got some money out of it. OK, we'll play red. Who wants red? Who wants blue? OK. I'm going to play red a bunch. Red, 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 red. OK. Um, all right. Now what should happen? We're going to play again. Let's play, play, play 11. Should I play? Who wants red? OK, it's, uh, we've got some diehard red fans. Who wants blue? OK, everybody wants blue. So we'll play blue. What's going to happen when I play blue? I'm going to get a dollar. What are you going to want after that? Like, more blue, because nothing's really changed. So, so one interesting thing is once you switch to blue, there's really not a great reason to switch back on the surface here. OK, but what just happened? Let's take a step back. What just happened? You did not take an MDP and solve it, because I didn't give you the MDP. What did you do? You interacted with the real fake world, 
And then you took those observations and you used them to figure out a little bit more information about the MDP. And as you gathered information about the MDP, you started to have different opinions of what you should do. And eventually you decided that red appears to be sort of a loser. Although, in fact, it could be amazing and you were just unlucky. But from your experience, you know? All right, that was not planning. That first time when you calculated averages and then you just went for it and you pulled the red lever forever, um, that was offline planning. Um, this was learning. You did reinforcement learning. There was an MDP, but you couldn't solve it with computation because you didn't know the parameters. You needed to actually act to figure out the parameters by seeing samples of the behavior of the system. You also saw basically every idea that is kind of core to reinforcement learning right there, even with that simple case. So one important idea in reinforcement learning is exploration. You have to try unknown things in order to get information. So red was, in fact, not a very good slot machine. But you didn't know that, and you had to try it. And everything that's unknown, the only way to figure out what those parameters are is to actually try it. That's, that's called exploration. When you take an action and your payment is not like slot machine dollars coming in, what, are, what did you get paid in when you pulled that red lever? You got paid in knowledge. You got paid in experience. And that experience helps you make better decisions in the future. So exploration is you have to sometimes do things for the experience rather than for the yield. Exploitation, on the other hand, is eventually you have learned all you care to know about that red slot machine, and you're done. You're like, OK, enough exploration. It's time to, it's time to pull the blue lever. Right? It's time to exploit the knowledge I have in order to get return. Right? You also uh, discovered the concept of regret. Okay, this does not mean exactly what it means informally. Regret is the, is the idea that even if you learn intelligently and you do an optimal job given your uncertainty of trying things out, you will not do as well as if you had actually known the MDP to begin with. Regret is the difference between um, what you experience and the best that you could possibly have gotten in sort of in retrospect. You also, um, you also ran into the idea of sampling, because there's chance you can't just try the red thing once and be like, oh, it's a two. It's a 100% payoff. You have to do things over and over again. And that has consequences. When you do reinforcement learning, you got to keep trying things over and over and over again. And the more complicated they are, maybe the more times you have to try them. And trying things in the real world, this isn't simulation. This is like you actually like send that helicopter, helicopter up in the air, it crashes, and you buy a new one. You might have to do that a lot. Right? Experience can cost. Okay, and sampling means you have to try things repeatedly. Also, difficulty. This is like the simplest MDP you could possibly imagine, and solving it, in the case of the known MDP, was trivial. You didn't need value iteration. You didn't need anything from the past few lectures. You just needed a description of the problem and your basic mathematical intuitions, and you were done. As soon as I take away that probability, suddenly it's hard. How many times should I pull that lever? Should I switch back? Should I ever switch back? Suddenly, these questions that were very easy are very hard, simply because learning is much harder it's much harder to learn an MDP than it is to solve a known one. Any questions on any of that? OK, next time, uh, reinforcement learning. We will think about how you should act when there are MDPs, but you don't know any of the parameters. And the only way to learn what's going on is by interacting with the world. So uh, we will start that next lecture.